we've been working on literally um, from a theory standpoint, hardware standpoint, algorithm standpoint, the industry's been working on this since roughly the 60s or 70s. It became really um, kind of a hot area in the 80s and we weren't really able to make a whole lot of progress, but the hardware's come a long way to where we now have what you see before you here, which is uh, the world's first uh, 50 qubit quantum computing system. This obviously looks like no other computer you've probably ever seen. Um, and the reality is the vast majority of what you see here is all about isolating the computer, the quantum computer itself. The actual quantum computer is a chip which will be housed inside this canister. And it's a single chip at this point uh, with, uh, with um, 16 qubits, 20 qubits, or 50 qubits as we continue to grow it. And the whole point of this apparatus is to isolate that chip from any form of noise. And noise in this case can be electrical noise, magnetic noise, but actually most critically thermal noise. So just the temperature of the room uh, is, is a huge detriment to, to a quantum system. Uh, so all of these levels here are basically trying to cool the system down and isolate it from any kind of thermal electrical noise. Let's start with quantum computers in general. I don't know how much you know about quantum computing, but it is a completely different form of computing. Um, the idea at sort of a high level is, in classical computing, uh, we have a bit, uh, which is either a one or a zero, and so you can uh, make up any number, of course, and you do a lot of number crunching. Uh, in quantum computing, you have a qubit, which uh, is some sort of quantum state that can also be a one or a zero. But because there's a quantum state, it can actually be in a superposition of one and zero. So in a sense, it can be both one and zero at the same time. Um, and qubits can entangle with each other, so the state of one qubit can actually just depend on the state of the other qubit. So when you manipulate them, you actually are manipulating multiple states at once. So what that really means is that you can explore a very large number of bits or, or potential solutions to a problem in one step. So you can think of it as sort of massive parallelization. Um, now, this only works, of course, for certain algorithms. You're never going to use this to run your, your PowerPoint or anything on your, on your laptop. It will clearly be integrated with other uh, classical computing systems. Uh, but for a subset of problems, uh, it's actually certain things you can do on a quantum computer that you could never do on any classical computer you could ever build in the age of the universe because it's just that much exponential um, power that goes into to going two to the end versus just to n, in, in a sense. The kinds of things that you can do with it, I think whatever in here's quantum computing, the first thing they think of is uh, cryptography, uh, because there's all this talk about the fact that you could build a quantum computer that could break the encryption and break the internet and end life as we know it. Um, that's not going to happen anytime in the near future. And quite honestly, if you had a quantum computer big enough to do that, you could then do a different form of encryption which the quantum computer could not break. So, you know, as, as always, these things uh, come with both uh, the, the ability to do good and bad as you go along. Um, and the reality is you'd have to be something like millions of qubits in order to do that. As I said, this is a 50 qubit system here. It's just a prototype that we've, we've got started. We actually have on the cloud today a 16 qubit system, which people can use uh, for free. And in our commercial offerings, we have a 20 qubit system. Um, so we're talking in the tens of qubits right now. So you need to get to millions of qubits before you can really do anything in cryptography or factorization. But long before that, and one of the reasons it became really interesting to people to do quantum computing, is you could do things uh, in the realm of quantum chemistry or material simulations. Um, uh, the uh, physicist Feynman was very famous for saying that you know, the world is not classical, it is quantum. So if you want to simulate it, you need a quantum system to do it. So the idea here would be if you're trying to say simulate a molecule, a fairly complex molecule, today we use really high performance supercomputers um, and you can only do a limited number of atoms uh, before even those computers can't do it. This will allow you to directly simulate that, those molecules um, with only a few qubits because each qubit is itself quantum so it can actually take on all the same states you get in the quantum molecule and test all those states at once. Uh, we just released a paper in Nature earlier, or September of last year, uh, showing that you could simulate, even on just a 16 qubit system, uh, some two atom molecules, beryllium hydride, a lithium dihydride. Um, so these are very simple molecules. Um, you can obviously simulate those on a normal system too, but it proves out the point you can actually do it with a quantum system. And the interesting thing is by the time you get to 50 qubits, which again, this is a prototype at that level, you can now start to simulate some molecules on that system that you can't simulate on any classical systems today. So really only in the 50 to 100 qubit range, you suddenly get to a point where you can do things you can't do any other way. And that's why suddenly people become interested in it.
way I like to think about it is, if, if you think about a classical system, if you have 50 bits, you basically have an, a power of n. You can do 50, let's say 50 things, 50, 50 different bits, bins you can put in there. If you have 50 qubits, you can do two to the 50 different states. So that's two to the n. So you get an exponential change on that. So if I do 10, which I can do in my head, so 10, 10 bits for this, two to the 10 would be what, 1,024 uh, states that this system would do. So if you think about it that way, that's probably the easiest way to, to do an analogy. It really does depend on the algorithm you're running though in the end. Um, and the key is to find algorithms where you're looking for a large number of states that you can map onto these qubits. Uh, so I mentioned quantum chemistry. That's straightforward because those are themselves quantum interactions. But we're also looking at for other types of optimization problems or even search problems. Uh, things where like a traveling salesman kind of problem. There's a lot of work going on in the algorithm space right now to figure out which of these problems we can really fit onto a quantum computer. In fact, as we continue the hardware, the theory work and the algorithm work is going on in parallel both obviously at IBM but across the academic world. Um, and that's one of the things that's really exciting is that for the first time people can actually start to test some of these ideas that have been around in theory for quite a while. Um, there's also a, a carryover to the machine learning space. Uh, in fact, we, we're, we're using some machine learning to help us understand how to make a better quantum computer, to make a more stable system. At the same time, a, a quantum computer of, of a large enough size could start to help us search a machine learning space to help narrow in on an area that you should be looking at before you apply the machine learning algorithms to go in and, and actually find what you're looking for. So there's a lot of interesting uh, different application areas that can come out of it. I think that the idea of being able to use it um, to help us narrow spaces of machine learning is really intriguing. And I will also say very clearly it's one of the more speculative areas too because it's something we're just starting to figure out. But we, we know that as we get to these larger and larger data sets and we're all talking about AI and cognitive, we know how, how hard it is to do really large sets of data and go through and search it. If you could have a system on the quantum side that could narrow that space for you a bit um, using more of the quantum superposition effects and then have a smaller subset you're working on, that could be a, a real game changer in terms of what we think about we could do with AI.